12. And there's a couple of things uh, that I want to point out to you before I actually get into the title or the meat of the sermon uh, this morning. I want you to look with me at Luke chapter number 12, verse number 1. I want you to notice verse number 1 here. It says this, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, now watch this, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So I want you to notice there in verse number 1, it begins with the context of Jesus Christ speaking unto his disciples and everyone that is gathered together to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And he tells them that he's referring to hypocrisy. This is a theme actually in Luke chapter number 12 where he tells them to beware of a few things. I want you to look with me again at verse number 4. It says this, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. So now he's telling you in this case, this is something you do not need to worry about. This is something that you do not need to beware of. But look at verse number five. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. So in this case, again, he's telling you something that you do need to beware of. He's talking about being aware of the Lord, being fearful or afraid of the Lord. Actually, what I want to focus on is in verse number 15. Again, something in this chapter that he tells you to beware of. Look at verse number 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. The title of the sermon this morning is Beware of Covetousness. Beware of Covetousness. Now, I was going to preach on this right around the, the, the time of Christmas. Because, of course, as everyone is aware, you know, our society has just become extremely materialistic. We live in a society that is extremely covetousness. Covetous. Now, uh, you know, covetousness is something that, you know, in our society, even amongst Christians, it's never preached against. It's like people are not aware or like people are not taking heed to Jesus' words and not being aware of covetousness. It's one of those things that even if you were to speak to a Christian, maybe just your average independent Baptist, you know, that just goes and attends church three times a week, not necessarily at a ministry or anything like that, just an average Christian that goes to church. If you were to speak to them and, and actually explain to them what covetousness is, they would probably disagree with you. They would probably say, well, that doesn't sound right. I don't think that that necessarily is wrong or sinful, you know, to look at something that someone else has or to look at something in a store and desire to have it, you know. But I'm, that's what I'm, we're going to dive into this morning. I want to start out in a very fundamental way. I want to define for you what covetousness is. And I'm going to be preaching to you this morning the dangers of covetousness. Now, covetousness is the most dangerous sin, I personally believe. Believe. And I'm going to show you why. It is the most dangerous sin that there is. I want to begin, as I said, by defining the word covetous for you. Because as I said, it's not a word that's used very often. Even amongst Christians, it's not discussed very much. So I want you to go to Romans chapter number 7. We're going to begin in Romans chapter number 7. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 7. To <clears throat> get the definition of covetousness. We use the Bible to define it as we so often do. Look at Romans chapter number 7. I want you to look with me at verse number 7. The Bible says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. Then he says this, For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So I want you to notice there that he makes a statement. He said, for I had not known lust. He, he's saying he would not have known what lust was except the law had said. If it wasn't for the fact that the law said or the law taught, thou shalt not covet. So notice that he learned what lust was by the commandment, thou shalt not covet. And that is actually the definition of the word covet. To covet something is to look at something and to lust after it. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 17. Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 17. 
to lust after something, to desire something. We're going to see that right now. Desire is also another word uh, for the word covet. All three of these words are used interchangeably. Look at Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 17. The Bible says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbors. So right here we have in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter number 20 is where the Ten Commandments are given and it plainly tells us that it is one of the Ten Commandments that we are not to covet. Thou shalt not covet. And he goes through a list of things. I want you to turn now to Deuteronomy chapter number 5 verse number 21. He goes through a list of things there. He says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. It says, Nor his wife. That's referring to your neighbor's wife. Nor his manservant nor his maidservant, these are all things that your neighbor possesses, right? Nor his ox, nor his ass, and then it says this, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So we can understand from this passage as well, from you know, uh, uh, you know, this commandment, the Ten Commandments, that coveting is looking at something that is not yours. Coveting is looking at something that your neighbor rightfully possesses and lusting after it or desiring it. I want to show you that here in Deuteronomy chapter number 5. Deuteronomy chapter number 5. De the book Deuteronomy, actually what the title of the book means, means second law. So you'll notice if you read the book of Exodus and then you read the book of Deuteronomy afterwards, you'll probably notice that things are being repeated. And that's exactly what's going on. In the book of Deuteronomy, what it's doing is just repeating everything that was given in Exodus. It actually just repeats the law a second time. It's a good way to remember this by likening it unto the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record the same story, just kind of from a different perspective, and we can learn things by comparing them and, and seeing the different wordings that are used in the two accounts, that's exactly what happens in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy. They're parallel uh, accounts of the same thing. Now I want you to look with me here at Deuteronomy chapter number 5. We're going to see the Ten Commandments being given again. Specifically look at verse number 21. It says this, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor. So what is the definition of the word covet? It is to lust. What is the definition of the word covet? It is to desire. It is to look at something that does not belong to you. It is to look at a possession that rightfully belongs to another, your neighbor, or just anyone else, and to lust after that, and to desire that. Covetousness is desiring something that is not yours. Covetousness is looking at something that does not belong to you and that you do not possess and desiring it. There are two different types of covetousness. And I'm going to talk about this very briefly. There are actually two different types of covetousness in the Bible. So, number one, the definition that I just gave you. To desire something that is not yours. But a much more broader definition or enough, a much more broader explanation of covetousness is to desire something that is off limits. It is to desire something that is off limits. And there are a couple examples that I'm going to give you uh, in uh, uh, the sermon this morning of this. Uh, so it's, it's anything, number one, something that is off limits, anything, number one, that is someone else's. Now that's off limits. That would fall under this broad umbrella of something that is off limits. If it's someone else's, God says that's covetousness if you look at it and desire it. But it's also off limits if God just says you cannot have it. So if you look at something, and this is found in the Bible a few different times, if you look at something and desire something that you are not supposed to have, that God has said that you cannot have that, you should not have that, and you look at it, and you lust after it, or you look at it and you desire it, that is also a sin and that is also covetousness. An example of this, just quickly, would be things like alcohol and drugs. You know, we're told to look not thou upon the wine. We should not be looking at alcohol and desiring it. It is a sin to do so. Now, I want to get into my first point. So just now we just defined the word covetousness. For, I just defined the word covetousness for you in the Bible. So we have a definition of what that is. But the first point this morning is covetousness is a sin of the mind and the heart. It is a sin that takes place within your thoughts. It is something that you do. It is not a physical act. 
You know, the majority of sins, almost all sins, take place by actually doing something, by a physical act that you go out and you perform or you practice. The majority, almost all sins, are you actually doing something with your body, right? Well, the act of or the sin of uh, covetousness is actually in your mind. It takes place in your mind. It is the thought of looking at something and desiring to have it. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 119. Psalm chapter number 119. I'm going to read to you from Ezekiel chapter 33, verse number 31. The Bible says this, And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. And he says this, For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. So notice that where is the covetousness taking place? It's taking place within their heart. It's something within your heart. It's something within your mind. It takes place in your thoughts. Psalm chapter number 119, look at verse number 36. Psalm chapter number 119, verse 36 says this, Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. So notice he's talking about his heart and he's saying incline my heart. He wants his heart to go after God's testimonies. He wants to be thinking about and meditating on the testimonies of God, the commandments of God, right? And he doesn't want his heart to go after covetousness. Notice it's something that takes place in the heart, in the mind. Uh, I want you to turn now to, in the Old Testament, go to Isaiah chapter number 57, verse number 17. 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse 14 says this, Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and then it says this, And heart they have exercised <clears throat> with covetous practices. Cursed children. So notice the heart is exercised with covetous practices. And just prior to that it says having eyes full of adultery. So what does it mean eyes full of adultery? They're looking and they're desiring or they're coveting or they're lusting after their neighbor's wife or they're lusting after you know another woman that they are not married to. So a woman that does not belong unto them. So that is an example of covetousness and where is it taking place? It's taking place within the heart. It's taking place within the mind. It's taking place within their thoughts. Look at uh, Isaiah 57 verse number 17 the Bible says for the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth that means angry and smote him I hid him and was wroth and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. So over and over again, when it's talking about a person committing covetousness, when it's talking about a person desiring something or lusting after something, it's taking place in their heart or in their mind, in their thoughts. Go to Jeremiah chapter 22, verse number 17. Jeremiah chapter number 22, verse number 17. You're also going to notice that the eyes are being mentioned repeatedly. That's something that we're going to see over and over again. Because in order to, to covet after these things, you have to first look at them. You have to set your eyes upon them. You have to look at the possessions that are in the window when you're walking down the street or you're walking in the mall. You have to look at your neighbor's vehicle and then desire after it, right, or lust after it. So the eyes are going to be mentioned repeatedly. It says in Jeremiah 22, 17, but thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. So it begins with the mind, it begins with the eyes, it begins with the heart where you look at something and you lust after it, where you look at something and you desire it. And what is that? That is covetousness. That is covetousness. Now this point actually builds into the next point, the point that we're on right now, the fact that this is a sin that occurs into the mind occurs in the mind. This is a sin that occurs in the heart or in the thoughts. That is where it begins. Now, because of that, covetousness is the gateway to all sin. Covetousness is the gateway to all sin. It starts in the mind, but then you go out and you actually start to practice it. What happens is you first covet your neighbor's wife. You first look at your neighbor's wife, and then a person goes out and commits adultery. A, per a person maybe that you know covets a vehicle, a car, or a you know uh, whatever it may be, a possession of their neighbor. It starts with looking at it and desiring it, but then you know where it ends up: theft. 
So it begins with covetousness. And another point that I want you to notice uh, uh, that is an extremely common theme throughout the Bible with covetousness is violence. Because oftentimes what people do is they covet something and then they end up taking it by force. They desire something and then they end up taking whatever it may be uh, by force. So covetousness is the most dangerous sin because it is the gateway to all sin. It is the gateway to all sin. Before you commit a sin, you know what you do? You first desire to sin. You first think about it and want to do it. And then you know what happens next is then you actually practice it. Then you actually take part in that particular sin. I want you to go to James chapter number 1 verse number 14. I'll show you this in the Bible. The Bible teaches this very clearly actually over and over again. James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1. <clears throat> Here in James chapter number 1, it's just speaking in general of sin. Now I want you to notice the process of where it begins. James chapter number 1, look at verse number 14. James chapter number 1, verse number 14, it says this. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own, look at this, lust. What is lust? It's covetousness. When he is, tempt, he is tempted and drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now watch this. Then when lust hath conceived... It bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So where does sin begin? Just in generalities here. This is just speaking in general. Right? Where does sin ultimately begin? Where is the starting line for sin? It begins with lust. And what is the definition of lust? It is covetousness. To lust after something is to covet after something. If you think of even in the Ten Commandments, you think, uh, you know, uh, commandment, the commandment specifically that tells you thou shalt not covet. And then he gives you a list of things you're not to covet. He says thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Well, one of the commandments is thou shalt not commit adultery. So the commandment right previous to that, right before that was thou shalt not commit adultery. So how are you going to get to that point first to where you actually do commit adultery? Where does that begin? Well, it would begin by violating the, first, the other commandment, commandment number nine, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. You know, theft is also one of the Ten Commandments. You know, you're not supposed to steal. Well, where is that going to begin? It's going to begin by looking at something that's not yours. Maybe your neighbor's ass, maybe your neighbor's, you know, uh, uh, ox, whatever it may be, right? Anything, obviously, you know, you know, we're not, you know, we don't, there's not asses and oxen everywhere today where we're going around and coveting that. But maybe his vehicle, maybe his car, right? Maybe whatever the possession is, somebody first looks at it, they violate the command, thou shalt not covet, and then they act on it, and then they go out and they break another Ten Commandments. So where did it begin? It begins with covetousness. All sin begins with covetousness. Now I want you to go to Joshua chapter number 7. And where does that start? It starts with the eyes. You first look at it. You desire it. The very first sin in the Bible began with covetousness. Genesis chapter number 3 verse number 6 says this. And when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, then it says this, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. What is the definition of covetousness? It is to desire something according to the Bible. It is to lust after something. So where did the very sin and the fall of mankind actually start? What initiated that? She looked at it and she coveted something that was off limits. She coveted. Now, specifically, who did it belong to? Obviously, you could say it belonged to God, but ultimately everything belongs to God, right? It wasn't another human being's possession, was it? But it was off limits. It was something that she was not allowed to have. And it was wrong for her, it was wrong for Eve to look at that and to desire it and to want it and to lust after it. Let me get there where you are. Joshua chapter number 7. Joshua chapter number 7, verse number 20. Joshua chapter number 7 is what we're going to look at. Verse number 20. This has to do with Achan. It says this, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Now watch this, verse number 21. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then it says this, Then I coveted them, now look what took place next, and 
took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Now Achan and his family ends up being burned to death. Achan and his family ends up you know, receiving the punishment of death. Now, what started Achan's sin? The, the sin specifically that had him put to death and also his family killed along with him was specifically that he took these things, that he was not supposed to have these things. And what did he do? It says, first off, he looked at it. Then it says, I coveted it. Then he did what? Then he took it. So it began with his eyes. It began with a, a sin of the mind. He looked at it. And while he was looking at it, what did he do? He desired it. He lusted after it. Now, did that specifically, those, did those possessions belong to any person in particular? I want you to think about that. Everybody's dead. You could say it belonged to God again because you remember, you know, there's the, the, the ten cities that were destroyed and the first city was the tithe. It doesn't specifically tell you that, but you can, you can figure that out by, you know, studying it out. And he says the first one's going to be his because he always gets the firstlings of the flock. The ten cities, he got the tenth of that. Everything belongs to God ultimately. So what happened here? This was something that did not belong to any individual person. But you know what it was? It was off limits. It was something that he was not to have. It was something that he was not to possess that God had specifically told Joshua to tell all the children of Israel that they are not to take any of the possessions. They're to kill everything and burn everything. Right? They, weren't to, they, weren't to, you know, they were not to possess these things. Right? What did he end up doing though? It says that he looked at it. Even though it didn't belong to a specific individual, he said he coveted after it. He desired it. He wanted it. What does that mean? It means he lusted after something or desired something that was off limits. So where did that sin begin for Achan? It began with covetousness. Ultimately, he ended up stealing something and then he was put to death. But where did his sin begin? It began with covetousness. So I want you to notice how dangerous covetousness is. This is not something I believe that is preached on enough. I don't think that it's harped on enough. Because it is extremely dangerous, you would expect pastors and preachers all across the United States to be warning people about it. But the truth from the Bible about covetousness is truly this. That all sin begins with covetousness. It is the root of all evil. I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Now 1 Timothy chapter number 6 is, is often, uh, I believe, misunderstood what it is teaching. And I'm going to uh, you know, tie this chapter together for you in a couple of different ways by context and also by comparing Scripture with Scripture and Jesus' teaching on this subject. But I want you to look with me at 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse number 10. <clears throat> I want to explain to you a very famous uh, 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 statement here and what it actually means. 1 Timothy chapter number 6, look with me at verse number 10. The Bible says this, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now this is an extremely famous uh, uh, statement. This is an extremely famous phrase. You hear people saying this that are not religious at all. You start to quote this to somebody. I mean, it's almost as popular, it seems like, as John 3, 16. Everybody hears this. It's one of those things that really caught on because it's so true, right? But notice it says, for the, for the love of money, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, I want to explain a concept to you, and I'll do it this way. What is the sin of the love of money? What is it? What is actually the sin that is being, what, what commandment or what you know, statute is being broken when you have the love of money? What sin is taking place in your heart? Covetousness. Covetousness. Now I remember when I first understood this actually was when somebody had posed a question. I was listening to two people talk about it. And one person stumped another person when they were talking about this because he was explaining that he believed that what this was teaching was covetousness. And that is, that is what this is teaching. I'm going to show that to you. And the other person was saying that he did not believe that that's what it was teaching. You know, that he thought it was just specifically the love of money. With ultimately those two things, and the, the, that's the error is they're ultimately the same thing. But uh, the other guy, you know, uh, 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 brought up a couple of points. And one of the things that he brought up was, well, then how would you explain the first sin of mankind? If you believe that it's specifically the love of money, right? And it's, not and it's not covetousness, it's not desiring something that is not yours, or it's not desiring or lusting after something that's not yours, then how would you explain the very first sin of mankind? Because in that case, obviously that sin was not committed for the love of money specifically, right? So, but, if the, but if what this verse is saying is 
The love of money which is covetousness, right? The love of money which is covetousness is the root of all evil, then that makes perfect sense. Right? Because what was the root of that sin? Where did it begin? And the text actually even tells you when you read the account of the first sin of mankind. It started when she looked at it and when she desired it. You can actually go back to Genesis 3 and you can prove that covetousness was where that sin began. And when we study throughout the Bible, we can see that this is taught repeatedly that it, it first begins with covetousness and then what happens? Other sin follows, right? Well, I want to show you that that is actually what this is teaching uh, by a couple of different ways. I want to read to you first from, from Luke chapter number 16, verse number 13 and 14. It says this, Jesus speaking, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, what is mammon? It's basically money. It's basically possessions, right? That's what mammon is. It's basically money or possessions or things. That's what it's referring to. So notice he says you cannot serve God and mammon, right? Then he says this right afterwards, verse number 14. And the Pharisees also, so still tying in what he had just said, also, who were covetous, heard all these things and they derided him. So I want you to notice there that while he's speaking about money and he's talking about a person not being able to serve God and mammon, he specifically right afterwards in application to who that applies to talks about covetousness. Now what is the love of mammon? It's the love of money. And what does Jesus actually say that that is when he's in application speaking about the Pharisees and why he just said what he said? They were what? What was the sin that they were committing by the love of mammon? It was covetousness. Now if you just read the context, and it's very, very simple to figure out, right here in verse number 10, it tells you what it's referring to. Look at verse number 10. It says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Then it says this, Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So actually in verse number 10 it tells you what the sin is that is being committed when it says the love of money. What is the love of money? What is it when someone loves money or they love mammon? They are a covetous person. They are coveting after something. They are looking at something and desiring something or they just want more of something that is off limits. They desire something that is not theirs. So all sin, the root of all sin is covetousness. That is the root of all sin. I want you to turn to, go ahead and turn to Micah chapter number 2. Micah chapter number 2. I want to hit on a very specific point. I want you to go, as I said, to Micah chapter number 2. And that is, <clears throat> covetousness is extremely dangerous for people that are in the position of authority or leadership. Now this applies to uh, people at, at, at a, at a you know, job, people running a country, you know, people that maybe head a ministry, people maybe that are pastors. You know, uh, but it also applies to fathers. It also applies to husbands. What happened to Achan? Notice that his family ended up you know, receiving the wrath of God as well because of his poor decisions. And all to, all, a lot of times uh, what ends up happening is people that have any sort of authority, especially not so much as you know, fathers and, and just husbands in that position of authority, but people that gain great authority, what they end up doing is they end up abusing that authority. They end up abusing that authority and they desire more. They, all, they want more. You know, and that's why it's very important for all of us to guard our hearts from covetousness. In whatever area or stage of life that we're in, this is something that we need to beware of because of how dangerous covetousness is. And all throughout the Bible, oftentimes when someone is coveting something, it's very often someone that already has a lot of wealth or someone that already has a lot of authority and power. And what they'll do is they'll abuse that authority and power and they'll take something by violence or they'll take something by oppression or they'll take something you know, by harming or hurting other people. Now I'm going to read you, uh, I want to finish there in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, the context uh, of that chapter that we were just reading in the subject of covetousness. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse number 3, it says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, godliness, it says this, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, 
railings, evil surmisings. Now, pride is also something that's oftentimes we're going to see associated with covetousness. Then it says this, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. And then it says, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Then he goes on, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Uh, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So notice the dangers. It said, but they that will be rich. What does it mean there when it says they that will be rich? Not those that exactly want. It's not those that you know end up being rich. That's not what it's saying. Those that become rich. It's actually saying they that will be rich. It's saying those that want to be rich. And you know there are a lot of people out there that just desire to be rich. They just desire more money. Now it doesn't have to be money. It could be just possessions. You know they're interchangeable, right? You know in a lot of societies they may not even have. You know uh, many times throughout history this is the case in civilizations they may not even have some sort of you know uh, 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 um, actual um, um, money that they would hand back and forth. They would just barter for uh, you know goods and services. They would just exchange goods and services. And possessions is ultimately what you desire when you desire. That money just represents a possession. That's all that it does. It, it represents something that you're going to be able to go and purchase and actually have and tangibly use. So when a person is, is you know, loving money, what they're ultimately loving is possessions. That's what they're ultimately, because the money itself is just going to end up getting you possessions or getting you, you know, goods and services or things along those lines. So what it's saying is they that will be rich. What does that mean? They that want to be rich. You know, we should be content. We shouldn't be desiring more things. We shouldn't be looking at things and coveting after more things. So where did I have you turn? Micah chapter number 2. Okay, I'm going to read quickly from one other place. Habakkuk chapter number 2. And I want you to notice all of these uh, consistencies with this. Habakkuk chapter number 2 verse number 5 says this, Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man. Neither keepeth at home. And then it says, who enlargeth his desire as hell. So notice that he has a desire and he's enlarging his desire. It says, as hell and is as death. And cannot be satisfied. Notice this person cannot be satisfied. They just keep desiring more. But gathereth unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. Notice that. Woe, so he's desiring something. He's heaping unto himself things that are not his. And then it says, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. So what is he doing? He's adding unto himself possessions or things that are not his own. What is that referred to as? With the desire, it would be covetousness. It says, How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay, shall they now rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them? Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. <clears throat> Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Notice what this person wants. He's a proud man and he wants to set his nest on high. He's desiring just to have more possessions, just to have more power, just to heap unto himself more things from other people. He just wants to take more from others. And notice how serious it is. It says, woe to him. It says that two times. What does woe mean? Woe is associated with a curse in the Bible. So it's saying that something Something bad is going to happen to him. Now, very often in the Bible, when people covet things, what ends up happening is the same things are taken away from them. And if you would have noticed, that's what it said here. It said that when they take something, when they spoil many nations, it said, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Now, what were they supposed to do to the possessions that Achan ended up seeing, coveting, and taking? They're supposed to burn everything. Everything was supposed to be burnt. What ended up happening to Achan? Achan ended up being burned. That was the death that he died. Right here it talks about how this person's coveting things and spoiling other people. What's going to end up happening to him? 
They're going to come and spoil his things. What does it mean to spoil? It means to take away their possessions. It means to take away the things that they have. Very often throughout the Bible when someone covets something and takes it, what happens later on is someone comes and does the same thing to them. And this is how God's character takes place throughout the Bible very often because he's, a, he's an exactor. He's, he's very precise in his judgment because he's a perfectly 100% righteous, just God. So you're there in Micah chapter number 2. Micah chapter number 2, let me get there myself. <clears throat> Micah chapter number 2. Micah chapter number 2, look at verse number 1. Micah chapter number 2, verse number 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Merastite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz... I'm sorry, I'm in chapter number 1. Chapter number 2, verse number 1. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. Now I want you to notice, chapter number 2, verse number 1, where does it start? It says they devise evil and work iniquity upon their beds. What, is it, what are you doing when you're devising something? You're coming up with something. So where is this beginning? It's beginning in the mind. It's beginning in their heart. It's beginning in their thoughts. They're devising iniquity. That means they're coming up with a plan. They're creating something. And it says they're working evil upon their beds. This is something that's going on in their hearts. Now watch. When the morning is light, they practice it. So notice that it actually takes place later. They practice it later when it's light. It says this. Now watch the very last phrase. Excuse me. Because... It is in the power of their hand. So why is this person doing this? How is this person able to do it? It says because it is in the power of their hand. All, all, very often people that are in authority or people that are in power will abuse their power and abuse their authority and they will do so through covetousness. Just like it says here, because it is in the power of their hand. Look at what verse number 2, actually what it was explaining. They covet fields and take them by violence. So what was it saying when it said, woe to them that devise iniquity? That was talking about them coveting fields, coveting, looking at something that was not theirs. It began in the mind and then it says afterwards in chapter number 2, it says when the morning is light, they practice it. So verse number two is basically repeating the same thing. And it says, and they covet fields. And then it says this. This is them practicing it. And they take them, or they, and take them by violence. Where does it begin? It begins in the mind. It begins with them devising it in their mind. It begins with them thinking about it and lusting after it and, and, and desiring it. It says, and they covet fields and take them by violence. And houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. So where did this sin begin? The, the sin of violence here. The sin of theft. Where did it start? It started with covetousness. It began with them sitting down and thinking about how they desired something that was not theirs. It's very important as a leader in any sense not to be covetous because you are entrusted with power, you are entrusted with authority, and you are given this, 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 this opportunity where you actually have power and authority to do different things. But do you know what that also gives you the a, a capability to do? To abuse it. To take advantage of it. And a lot of times that's what people do. It's very common that people will take advantage of their authority. And do you know how they do it? through covetousness. That's where it begins. It begins with covetousness, then they abuse their power and they actually practice it and then they take things that are not theirs. That's why when choosing rulers in the Old Testament, Moses was specifically told not to pick men that were covetous. Exodus chapter number 18 verse number 21, Moreover thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, and then it says this, hating covetousness and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Why did, in here in Micah chapter number 2 at the very end, verse number 1, why did they, why were they able to do it? It says, because it is in the power of their hand. With that power, you have the ability to abuse that power. And oftentimes, that's what people will do. If you ever find yourself in a position of authority, in a position of power, you need to be even more aware. You need to be even more aware of you know, your heart and guiding covetousness away. Proverbs chapter 28 verse number 16 says, the prince, that's a ruler, that wanteth understanding, that means he lacks understanding, is also a great oppressor. 
Then it says this, But he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. Notice that the man that is covetous is an oppressor because he lacks understanding. But the man that hates covetousness, the good ruler, the prince that does despise covetousness, he's going to live a longer life. Why? Because when you oppress other people and you hurt other people, it comes back to you. You're going to be punished for that. Now, um, Jeremiah chapter number 8, verse number 10, this, these passages are actually talking about prophets and priests. Therefore will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For everyone from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. So notice that the prophet and the priest are given to covetousness. And notice what the punishment's going to be. Because they're given to covetousness. And in Exodus chapter 20 verse number 17 in the Ten Commandments, what specifically is mentioned that they are not to covet after? Wives, he says fields, and he mentions a, a few other things. Notice that this person is covetous, and notice that he says in order to punish them, you know what he's going to do? I'm going to give your field to somebody else. And I'm going to give, and he mentions specifically also, their wives unto somebody else. Just like we saw earlier. I mean, this takes place over and over again. Jeremiah 22, 16 says, he, judges, he, he judged the cause of the poor and needy, then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for covetousness, for thy covetousness, uh, and for shed and for to shed innocent blood, and for oppression and for violence to do it. So notice where it begins. It begins with covetousness, and then what happens? Oppression, and then what happens? Violence. Micah chapter number two here is extremely similar to what took place with Ahab, Jezebel, and Naboth's vineyard. Do you know what it's talking about here in Micah chapter number 2? It talks about it being in the power of his hand. He's a ruler and he's sitting upon his bed and he's practicing and he's desiring to, to have something. What was Ahab doing? Remember he was moping around. You know, and, and it may even have, have mentioned that he was on his bed or on his couch. Why? Because he desired Naboth's vineyard. He desired to have Naboth's vineyard. Then what ended up taking place? Then Jezebel ended up you know, conjuring up or devising up this plan for them to go kill Naboth. They killed him and what did they do? They took his vineyard away. Exactly what it says here. And they covet fields and they take them by violence. Covetous even can lead to murder. Covetous leads to harming people. They're walking down the street, someone will come up and just beat them up to take things away constantly. A lot, most thefts take place, take place in that way where people are overpowered or overcome. Not only that, you, know, you have the case of even rape. So you have rape taking place. And where does that come from, come from? It comes from covetousness. It comes from a person looking at something and desiring something that they should not have. You know, fornication, obviously. That, now, that's not necessarily, uh, you know, your neighbor's wife. But fornication is off limits. So if you're looking at and you're lusting after a woman, even if you're not married and she's not married, well, obviously, to go ahead and commit the act, that would be fornication. But even to look at her, that's covetousness. That's desiring something that is off limits. That's lusting after something that is off limits. Where does it begin? Looking at it. It begins with the eyes. It begins with the heart. It begins with the mind. And then what happens? And then it could be fornication or it could be rape. It could be, you know, it comes about through oppression, through violence, theft. You know, uh, it's always, it always begins, all sin begins with covetousness. Go to James chapter number 4. Wars, all wars that are fought begin with covetousness. All wars that are fought begin with covetousness. <clears throat> So if you, ever, if you ever find yourself in a position of authority or in a position of power, you need to be careful about covetousness. You need to be even more aware in your life about covetousness. You need to control your thoughts even more so. Now we should all strive to control the things that we think. We should all strive to control what we're looking at, what we're desiring, what we're lusting after. If you could control your thoughts, think about this. If you could control your, your mind, if that's what you put a lot of time focusing on, what you would be doing is nipping it in the bud. You'd be cutting it right off at the root. It's the root of all other evils. So if in your life, if you, if you, you know, really got a hold on 
your thought life, if you really got a hold on the things that you think about, if you really got a hold on the things that you go around desiring and lusting after, if you really controlled that, you could change your Christian life in a drastic way. You could change your Christian life in a major way if you can control the things that you covet after. And, and uh, you could just nip that in the bud, as I said. Where do I have you turn? James chapter 4. Look at James chapter number 4, verse number 1. <clears throat> From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. What does that mean, come they not hence? That means where do they come from? Where does it begin? Where did it start? Where do wars and fighting start? Where do, when someone is in an argument, right? This is specifically, you know, it uses the word wars and it's just as true to speak of a nation's warring. But even uh, uh, fightings, he's saying just in a generalized way, when people are fighting oftentimes, you know what it can come from? Covetousness. One person coveting something uh, you know, from another person, desiring some, something that another person has, and it will begin a fight. It'll, you know, uh, it'll end up with people fighting. It'll end up with people maybe literally fighting, physically fighting, or maybe just arguing. That's where fight, fights come from, according to the Bible. It comes from covetousness. But you, you could also desire, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, apply this to literal wars. Look at verse number two. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Where does the killing come from? It comes from lusting, from coveting. You, it says what? Ye desire to have. Notice lust, desire again, covetousness. These are all used interchangeable. Uh, so you desire it first. You look at it and you desire it. You lust after it. You covet after it. And then you take the next step and you commit another sin. So where does sin come from? All sin. Where did the very first sin of mankind come from? You know, it comes from looking at something and desiring it and lusting after it. And then the next step is actually taking part in that particular sin. Going out and committing whatever that sin actually is or whatever you are lusting after. Go back to, uh, I'm going to have you go to, actually you just, this will be the last place we turn to. Go to Hebrews chapter number 13. Verse number five. So first, we started off, we defined covetousness. It means to lust after or to desire something that is off limits. Now, why is it off limits? Number one, because it can belong to someone else. It may be your neighbors. It's something that is not rightfully yours, and it is wrong to look at those possessions or to look at those things and to want them or to lust after them and to think about, I'm desiring that. I want to have that. That is a sin. And, all, and you know, Oftentimes, as I mentioned, you speak to just Christians about this, and they're oblivious to it. They don't understand that, you know, just, you know, like a lot of, like a lot of men will do. Uh, you know, I know a lot of guys at, at my work will do this. You know, they'll, they'll just scroll through. They don't have any money to do it. They don't have any, you know, they're not actually in, in need of buying a new car or anything like that. But what they'll do is they'll get these magazines or they'll look at it on their phone and they'll just constantly just be looking at these possessions, looking at this merchandise, looking at all these products, just constantly things that they cannot have, things that they are not capable of, of purchasing, they don't have the funds to purchase it, but they're just looking at it. You know what they're doing? They're just, in their mind, they're just thinking, I wish that I could have that. I wish that that was mine. I desire to have that. That is a perfect example of covetousness. It's not yours. It's not yours, and it's wrong for you to just sit there and just desire that. And you know what you do is, it may start off to where it's just looking at, you know, whatever it may be, looking at uh, some sort of product that is too expensive that you can't have, and you even know, I'll never be able to purchase this. I'll never be able to have this. But what happens is that that sin of covetousness, it gets down and it takes root in your heart. And then it begins to spread, and then you start to just, you know, uh, uh, just it, like leaven, it just begins to, to spread in your life, and you start to covet after other things. And then this sin, just like how all sin does, it always begins, it always starts out small. Just look at any, you know, like what's a major sin that's very obvious? Drugs and alcohol, right? Where it spreads. And what does it do? It ends up taking over your life to where you end up becoming enslaved to such a thing. And to where that runs your life, that's all that you can think about. That's what happens with covetousness. But what's more dangerous, dangerous about covetousness is that when it, it's only, it's going to begin with covetousness. But then it's going to end with other sins. Because then over time, that covetousness is going to overcome you. 
to where you feel like you must have those things. Even though you don't have the ability to get it, it's not in the power of your hand, you're going to do whatever you have to do to, to obtain those possessions or those merchandise or whatever it is that you're coveting after. That's why covetousness is a more dangerous sin than all other sins. Because it leads, it begins with uh, lusting, with coveting. You know, and when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin hath conceived, it bringeth forth death. It begins with lusting. It begins with desiring something that is not yours. We shouldn't be looking at things and desiring things. We need, to, we need to be conscious of the thoughts of our mind. We need to be conscious of the things that we're thinking about and what we're, what we're looking at and what we're putting into our minds and the thoughts that we're, you know, we're thinking all the day long. This is very important. You know, because what happens is it begins with the thoughts of the mind. It begins with the sins of the mind, but then it ends up down the road becoming something much, much worse where you're actually practicing these things that you would never have thought that you would have done. So I had you turn to Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. Oh, I was reviewing the points and went off on a tangent there. So point number one was I was defining it. So it means to, uh, covet means to lust. Or covet needs to desire. Point number two is covetousness is the gateway sin. Covetousness is the gateway sin. Because of that, it is the most dangerous sin. Also, covetousness is very dangerous in the heart of a ruler or in the heart of a person that is in authority. All sin begins with covetousness. I want you to keep that in mind. The opposite of covetousness is contentment. The opposite of, of covetousness this is the last point. We're just going to look at, I'm going to read a couple other verses to you, but the opposite of covetousness is contentment. Let me read these two passages to you, and then we'll look there in Hebrews 13 where you're at. I'm going to read to you from where we were. You may or may not have noticed this. In 1 Timothy chapter number 6, <clears throat> verse number 4, or I'm sorry, I'm just going to read verse number 6. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. So notice he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Then verse number 10 where we read, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. So notice that covetousness can cause you to err from the faith. It can derail you from your Christian life. It can send you off the path that God would have you to walk, keeping the commandments of God, serving the Lord. It's very dangerous. And what's the opposite of covetousness? How should we be as a Christian? We should be content with such things as we have. Whatever area we are in life. It doesn't matter what you have. You should just be happy with the things that you possess and the things that you have. Philippians chapter number 4 verse number 11 says, Not that I, uh, that I speak in respect or in the way of want. Saying that I'm desiring things. Right? What would that be? To desire something would be to covet it or lust after it. He's saying it's not that I'm wanting something. Not that I'm desiring something. He says, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. That, sh that is what we should strive for. If we want to guide our hearts, or I'm sorry, guard our hearts from covetousness, <clears throat> what we need to do is we need to replace it with contentment. We need to make sure that we're happy with wherever we are in life. It doesn't matter because life is like this. You know, I've been at times in my life where I'm as broke as a joke. I've been at times in my life where I have money. I've been at times in my life where I'm, you know, moderate, right? When the church started off here, we were like struggling hardcore, like really super bad. And because we were having to pay, you know, we just, you know, uh, everybody's jobs weren't all lined out. The church didn't have money in the account. So we were paying like an extra, and hopefully we don't have to do that, you know, soon here. We were paying like an extra five, six hundred dollars a month just so that we could stay here in the building. And we were extremely broke. Like we were paying, and we hadn't done this for like five, six years of our life where we were paying all of our bills like, you know, three to four weeks late. It was just, you know, I'm big on finances and I'm real strict about, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm just, anybody who knows me, they know I'm not only a Jew spiritually, you know, I'm a Jew in the sense of finances too. I'm very strict with money. And I was just stressed out, just completely stressed out all the time about that. But you know what we need to do? We need to be content in whatever state that we're in. We need to work on just being satisfied or happy with wherever we are. And if you are struggling with money, you need to just you need to not be you know uh, covetous of other things. You need to not be desiring of other things. You need to not be just looking at things and, and saying, "Oh, I wish that I had that." Just be content or be happy with wherever 
you are in your life because life's like this and it's probably going to continue that way. For most people it does and there's no problem with that. You know, there's no, there's no issue with that at all. If you would have noticed in Luke chapter number 12, he talked about bewaring, beware of covetousness, but he afterwards mentions many, many times he talks about the, the, you know, the passages about where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. He talks about how, how, he, how we shouldn't be laying up treasures on this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. Be, you know, just like 1 Timothy chapter number 6 talked about it, it said, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Right. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. All of the possessions that you do have, and everything that you do possess, possess it doesn't matter whether you have you know, 10 times the amount of possessions than I have, or 10 times the amount of possessions that another person has in the church. Both of us, when we leave, are going to have the same exact amount. Of our physical possessions. Nothing. Right. When, you know, billionaires die, they leave this world with the same amount that the poplars do. Nothing. Period. You carry nothing out of this world. So then, once you step into eternity, you're going to find out what possessions you're going to have forever. You're going to find out what treasures you have for the rest of your life. That's why he tells the parable in Luke chapter number 12, right after he talks about beware of covetousness. He tells the parable about the man who, you know, uh, uh, he, you know he's, he's, he's setting up the barns, he's tearing down the storehouses, he's trying to create more room for more things. And then he gets to the point in his life where he's like, take thine ease, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, right? He says to his heart, right? He's speaking to himself. And then what happens? And then he dies. He says, you know, thou fool, he didn't know that his soul was going to be required of him that day. And you know what he wasn't? He wasn't rich toward God. He was rich in this world, but guess what? It didn't matter anymore. Right. Eternity is a lot more important than 70, 80 years of this, even if you get to live that long. You know, we live 70, 80 years, and how foolish would it be if we spent our life just desiring to have more our entire life of just these worldly, physical possessions? Because they're only going to last you another 40 years, and then when you die, you're going to heaven, and you're not taking any of them with you. But you know what you could do? You could spend your, your life while you're here... You could spend your life while you're on earth building up treasures and gathering up treasures and heaping up treasures in heaven that you can enjoy for all eternity. That you'll be able to enjoy for, forever. When you die, you're going to go to heaven and then you're going to have all these treasures that will never be taken away. A thief will never take them away. Once you get those treasures, they're eternal. They're never going to rust. They're never, never going to corrupt. The things of this world aren't of value as we, as we sometimes deceive ourselves. They aren't of the same value that we sometimes deceive ourselves into thinking. You know, they're just going to burn up. They're just going to, you know, you, know, uh, you know, different things that we get. A brand new car, what ends up happening to the van or the car that we get? You know, we, don't, we get vans here. We don't buy cars around here, right? We get a van and it breaks down. We get a van and it's clean and it's nice in the beginning and then it's got... Juice spilled all over the seats. It's got junk everywhere. It's just trash. You know, you know, just, you know, ir like some of the chairs, irreparable damage, right? There's just, you know, it's never coming out. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. It just becomes trashed. And then you look at it, and how do you look at it? Do you see it the same way that you viewed it before? Like, man, this is nice. You're like, man, this is a piece of junk. I'm ready to give this problem to somebody else, right? Trade this in for something else, you know? It's, everything in this world is like that. There's no exceptions. Nothing. It doesn't matter what, you know, possession that you get. Right? It doesn't matter. So do you know what we need to focus on? Focus on? We need to be content with whatever we have here because it doesn't matter. That's why. That's why. Because it's vanity and it doesn't matter. You need to be content with the things that you have. And contentment is the, is the best way to guard your heart from covetousness because it's the opposite. If you become content in your, in your Christian life, you are not a covetous person. It's the opposite of covetousness to be content. If you get to your, a point in your life where you're content, you're not, then you're happy. You're not looking and desiring anything else. That's, that's the definition of contentment. And what can bring about contentment is not spending our time thinking and looking upon the things of this world, but thinking and looking about heaven. And, you know, setting our affections in, in heaven. You know, we need to be thinking about heaven. We need to be trying to store up treasures in heaven and be content with such things as we have. Look at Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 5. Let your conversation... And conversation means 
uh, uh, your manner of living, your lifestyle, the way you live your life. It's not talking about how you speak to one another. That's what the word conversation in uh, the King James Bible means. It means the way you live your life. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Watch this. And be content with such things as you have. So notice that, I want you to notice as I've never heard anybody exposit this last part exactly. So he says, let your conversation be without covetousness. So he's saying live your life without being a covetous person, without desiring more. Then he says this, this is interesting, but be content with such things as ye have. Be content with what you do have. Then he says this, now notice in verse number 5 right after that, for, what does for mean? It means because. That's what for means. Because. He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What's he talking about that you have? Christ. That's what he's saying. He says, be content. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have, with what you do have. And then he says, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. So what is he saying? You should be content because you'll always have Christ. Isn't that enough? I mean, goodness sakes. I mean, what more could you ask for? Not only do we just have Christ, and just in general that we, He's dwelling in us, and, and we will forever be with Christ, we can, you know, being attached to that, we can know that includes, that means I'm going to heaven. That means I'm going to go to heaven, and I'm going to be rich toward God and have treasures in heaven when I die. But not only that, it also tells me that He's going to be with me while I'm on this earth. That he, his presence being there and him being with me and, and me never being able, as it says in Romans 8, to be separated from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, he'll always be there for me as well. He's not going to forsake me and leave me you know, in the gutter. Right? He'll continue to love me. You know, that's the greatest motivator to continually be content with such things. You have, you have the greatest thing that you could ever get, Christ. Amen. You have nothing more to ask for. There's nothing greater that exists outside of the Lord. And he says, that's what you have now, and he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. So what does that mean? You're always going to have it. That's the point. So that, you know, that's the best reason why you should continually be content. You may not have noticed this, but covetousness is the most dangerous sin that exists. If you become an extremely covetous person, you know what you're going to do? You're going to desire something, and then you're going to go get it, like Achan did. You're going to look at the fruit of the tree, and you know what you're going to do next? You're going to eat it. You're going to look at somebody else's field, and then you're going to end up going and taking it. You're going to look at somebody else's wife or somebody else, else's husband, and then you're going to go get it. You're going to look at somebody's possessions, and you maybe take it by violence. Covetousness is it is the love of, of money, right? And it is the root of all evil. All sin. All sin begins with covetousness. If you, can, if you in your Christian life can beware of covetousness, if you can beware of covetousness and guard your heart from covetousness, you will take a, 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 a very large step in your Christian life. If you want to eliminate sin in your life, of course you need to focus also on practicing the sin and, 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 and getting yourself away from it and you know, not, you know, ma not making provisions for the flesh, putting yourself in a situation where you, you're tempting yourself and causing yourself to sin. Yes, all, do all of that. But you know what you need to spend a lot of time on? The root of all of it. The root of every bit of it. And what is the root of all of it? Where does it all begin? Covetousness. Stop looking and thinking and desiring and lusting after things that are not yours. You know why? Because we as Christians, we as Christians should be more content than anybody else. We have more reason to be content than anybody else. We have riches in heaven and we have Christ that will never forsake us. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, everything that you've given us. We thank you for uh, uh, warning us, giving us the warnings to... Beware of covetousness, dear Lord. We ask you that you'd help us each day in our lives, that we would control our thoughts, control our minds, dear Lord. Help us not in this, in this, this uh, extremely and uh, 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 very much so covetous society that we live in. Help us not to follow suit. Help us to, uh, to, to not be conformed to the world in that aspect, but to transform our minds, dear Lord. We ask you that you'd be with our church. Uh, be with Mrs. Ashley in her surgery, be with the newborn baby, uh, that he would grow and develop well. 
be with all of the, the bops that are sick, uh, be with Brother Rick's back. We also ask you that you be with our church at this time, dear Lord. Help us to uh, reach this city, help us to grow, help us to have a big impact, dear Lord God. Help your spirit to be here and all of us just to become better Christians and uh, to focus on our lives personally. We love you so much and thank you for the many blessings that we do have. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.